first, I would like to start with the same question for each of you, because I would like you to introduce yourself, but also answer my question, which is, what was your biggest aha moment in understanding the importance of well-being in your career, of your well-being in your career? So, Olga, may I start with you? I think it was actually not at the point of my highest of the career, but at one point, my stepdad told me I look like a zombie. And uh, yes, I was working six days a week, and it was... Uh, and I got my wrinkles and I realized that I'm actually doing a lot of mistakes and I forget more. And I think that was the aha moment, the first one. And then with having my child, uh, I think the aha moment was that I need to kind of also be there for myself. Otherwise, the work that I do is not at the high quality that I would expect of myself. And we should also say what you are doing because you're not only mother, you are also a daughter of a successful mother. Uh, Ivana Tikac, but you have your own business in the field of healthcare, but a science field of healthcare, but also, if I may call it hospitality. So there's loads of different branches of what you do. Uh, what is, how would you introduce yourself? I would introduce myself as a crisis manager. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It seems that everything is in a crisis from the start. No, but because I think I don't, uh, I'm not really good at doing routine things. Um, that's not, I'm never going to be the best hotelier. I'm never going to be the best scientist. I am too much of being there when there is a crisis, setting the things back into order and then moving on. So I think uh, that's how I would describe flying crisis manager. Okay, thank you. How would Monica describe herself and where was her aha moment? <laughs> Uh, hello everyone, so for the introduction, I am uh, uh, an attorney at law and uh, partner at PRK Partners, which is a full service business law firm, and I have been uh, practicing law for almost two decades, <laughs> and uh, uh, originally started as corporate M&A lawyer working on transactions, speaking of work-life balance. And uh, about 10 years ago, I started focusing on uh, working for clients from the pharma and healthcare industries. So uh, my uh, connection to health and well-being well is uh, not only on personal level, but it's also within my uh, professional focus. And uh, for the aha moment, I, I, I was thinking about it here. So it, was, it, it, it hasn't come yet, probably. It uh, hasn't come yet. N not really, because I, uh, I see that throughout the time I'm learning more and more about the importance of this. And it's gradual steps. Uh, maybe uh, one moment was when, I had, um, when my daughter was born, I realized the Im importance of being more with her. But um, yeah, I see it as a process of continuously learning about that. Great, thank you. Katerina? So um, I spent 25 years in uh, tech companies worldwide, um, 14 years at Google, and uh, I held, you know, regional global jobs, managing uh, products and projects for 64 countries. And since 2013, I was also advising some uh, portfolio companies from Rockaway uh, Capital. And um, now I'm an investor, uh, so I'm a partner in uh, venture funds and also very active in uh, investments um, abroad mostly. And my aha moment was very significant, so I would say lucky you, um, because uh, that was in 2014 when I was working in London, I was managing mobile first effort for Google Emerging Markets, which was uh, 23 markets globally. And I was advising Rockaway Capital Lao Express, the transportation company, on how to uh, change their sales model. And basically, I was working for like 500%, right? Flying from Nigeria to India, Indonesia, Brazil was emerging market at the time. And then I stopped kind of being able to get out of the bed in the morning. And I started feeling empty. And I physically felt sick when opening my laptop. And I basically went through a burnout. So that was a massive aha moment. I had to make uh, significant changes, including uh, change of environment, um, the approach uh, to work, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that was a big one, yeah. 
Yeah, I believe so. And I, I must say, when you work with the startup, tech startup companies, you must see many people heading that way towards the burnout. Yeah, yeah, big time. Yeah, yeah. So I will talk about it maybe uh, later, but there, is, uh, there has been a significant impact of technology itself on um, our lives, uh, right? We could talk about the younger generations, but it impacted all of us and um, the work styles, uh, the, the feeling that we have to respond 24 seven, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's a serious topic. Thank you, Arta. Thank you. Um, I guess we all have several aha moments uh, as we go in different stages of life. I've started working since in high school, which was very uncommon for females at my age. Um, almost 20 years ago. So I was against my whole family, which they always said that um, education is first and then you start working. And I always thought, oh, I'm so busy and I'm working and like maybe complain more. But when I had my second child um, and I was raising a toddler and I was doing PhD, having a full-time job, and being a board member, I was like, okay, this is an aha moment, like, how can I manage all of that and keep myself sane, like, um, uh, health-wise, because you have to be fit for your kids, fit for uh, the work, fit for the audience, look good, take care of yourself and your spine, which you're holding most of the time, a toddler that doesn't care what you do or who you are because they want your full, time engagement with them. Uh, but uh, for every woman that uh, goes through pregnancy, it's kind of with everyone that I talked, at least in my perspective, they always felt like, yeah, you're less valued now because you're about to give birth and then it's gonna be like a pause that you're out of the market. And some other younger girls would come and, and get your place and everything. And I was seven months pregnant when the Minister of Education came and asked me to be the first chairwoman of the public university. And I was like, no way, you know, like I'm pregnant. How, how will you give me this opportunity? And obviously I took it with high responsibility and I, I tried to do my best, but this was like the biggest aha moment for me that uh, we sometimes underestimate the power that we have, especially when we go in these periods of pregnancy slash raising kids where the, the, the integration rather than work-life balance is more problematic than in any other stages of life. Yeah, that's probably the, the trust in ourselves we've spoken about and the panel and the previous panel. But you, your work focuses on female entrepreneurs and you do some researches. Could you share some of the insights you got out from those researches? How uh, do the, the, the female entrepreneurs navigate all those responsibilities, not only the career, but also family life? Sure. Uh, so besides that, I'm also a co-founder of Norwal Network, which I didn't mention because we are here to talk about uh, other engagements. Uh, as part of my PhD, I was focusing on four countries, Albania, Kosovo, North Macedonia, um, and Serbia. And I was interested to know how did the technology influence uh, women entrepreneurs in these countries? Did it help or not? Um, the work-life balance was one of the variables that I was checking, which was different in different countries. Uh, so Kosovo was rated the highest, meaning that for them work-life balance uh, was very important and that technology helped a lot to create a better work-life balance. The least uh, important was for North Macedonia, while Serbia and Albania were equally so in the middle. Uh, when discussing more with companies having interviews to have the, the content why this happened is also because a majority of the cases where women are uh, engaged in businesses are uh, jobs that still require physical presence, like textile, you know, it's a factory. So it doesn't matter how technology is moving, they still need to go physically there, produce there, and in some cases it would be an extra stress because the sales and marketing, which is online, would be done at home. So they would kind of work in the factory, but then once they're home, they can juggle around social media, post something, 
which uh, then, uh, in a way, it, it almost creates more stress than, uh, than it was in the past without the technology. So I, I guess it all matters in terms of the perspective and the category and the sector that uh, the women are more based. But what is very interesting from this research is the, uh, the entrepreneurial marketing. Um, globally, women are driven out of necessity. So there is no other option um, except to start a business because they cannot find a job or something like that. In my situation, the opportunity-driven entrepreneurs was rated quite high. And I believe this was mainly the case of access to funding, which is lots of donors supporting female entrepreneurs in this region. So it helped a lot to, uh, uh, to create this aspiring entrepreneurial mindset where they would go into entrepreneurship and view that as a good uh, financial independence rather than something that would uh, drag them down. Yeah, I must say this is, I think, quite specific for Central Eastern Europe. It's a bit different base and I, I'll be happy to hear from Katerina from her global uh, viewpoint how she sees it. But probably, Monica, uh, when we heard that the technology uh, can be a distractor as well as something that should help us. How do you see it? Uh, how do you use it in your personal career or life? Oh, well, I think for technology, uh, the saying that uh, it's a good uh, servant but uh, a bad master totally applies. And uh, we need to be aware of that. And I think we need to learn how to work with technology uh, to uh, make it uh, a source of help and not a source of destruction. So, uh, on one hand, what I definitely recommend, because it works well for me, it's to uh, set times when I am online and when I'm offline. Uh, so, just uh, switch it off sometimes and uh, be clear about that and uh, communicate it within your family, within, within your firm, when it's possible. So, for example, towards clients, you need to find another contact for, for them. But uh, technology can be also helpful. I think uh, this uh, event is uh, an opportunity to uh, see some of these uh, apps and uh, other tools that can help us. Uh, there, there are, of course, uh, applications that can help you uh, supervise or limit the time that your children spend on the screen. Uh, it can also uh, help you to uh, build some routines uh, that are important for uh, well-being, uh, whether it's uh, like monitoring sleep or reminding you to uh, go for a walk or uh, have a drink of water. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's for us to uh, look out there and uh, make conscious cho choices to achieve the best results for us. Yeah, I think we may have uh, conscious choices, but it's much more difficult when it comes to our kids. Uh, and I like how Olga puts it, uh, you say uh, more me time without increasing reliance on screen time. Uh, this is what I see with my kids when I uh, need my me time, I just let them be inside, in front of their screens because for me that's the way how to have a bit of rest, but that's not the right way, obviously. So, how do you see it as a mother? How do you feel that our uh, emotions, how do we feel? How does that influence our kids? And you may speak not only as a mother, but also as a daughter of a very busy mother. So, was it something that taught you this is not the way, or probably some lessons learned from your, my, from your mom, wow, this is how I should do it when I'll be a mother? <clears throat> I think um, I was, as a young kid, forced to do a lot of activities that I didn't like. And after being then alone, I stopped them, and then I returned to them because I loved them. So I think that's what I do with my son. I try to show him a lot of activities, and I try to also find fun in his activities so that we both kind of enjoy it. Because, okay, I hate Lego. Like, no. <laughs> I would throw it outside. But, like, learning about dinosaurs, why not? If we do it, like, go in more in depth. So I think it's like with everything. We have to find, like, a passion that stimulates our brain because... 
being a mother, you have to go to the age of the kid, but you can do it in a way that it stimulates in a way somehow both. So I would advise all mothers, like tell your husband to do the Lego if you hate it and really focus on the activities where you can both have fun. And uh, yeah, we both like biking, so we bike. I'm the sports mom, so. So you find a way how to relax, and you found the sport that we, we've heard about the pillars. So your sport is biking. Katerina, again, the tech industry, the technology is something we uh, look forward to as something that will make it easier for us. But also now we are kind of fighting if it is not eating us alive in a way. Uh, so how is it changing the behavior of young generation and how does that influence uh, our mental health. Yeah, so firstly, it's a very broad topic, very serious topic, so I will try to, uh, for the sake of time, to simplify. And uh, I will start with saying uh, I'm a technology optimist, okay? But despite that, um, you probably all realize that technology in the past, uh, let's say, 14 years, has had a significant impact on our lives. It's not about our kids uh, or teenagers uh, or specific generations, it's just impacted kind of all of us. And if you look back, um, you know, you don't really see much of a uh, mental illness crisis happening in the year of 2000 or 2005, where you see really the significant uh, kind of, um, you know, lines going really up is uh, starting from 2010. And uh, the, the average, uh, let's say, increase in mental in illness uh, globally, I'm talking about global numbers, um, between 2010 and 2020 um, increased and raised by 150% on average. That has a little bit more significant impact on the girls compared to the boys because they are uh, more vulnerable. Uh, but what does it say if you look back, what has happened, you know, around 2010? So uh, basically, the first iPhone was introduced in 2007, the iPhone 4 was introduced in 2010, Facebook uh, was uh, launched in 2004, my friend Kevin Systrom, he founded Instagram in 2010, sold it to Facebook 2012 and started picking up. And when we look back, it's really just a short period of time of 14 years when the social networking sites became social media. What happened is because like you all got cameras, our kids got cameras, then certain, um, let's say, originally uh, set up technologies that's supposed to interact in between like me and you, uh, opened the platform of interaction of me and many, right? The like button was introduced 2009, uh, notifications and the push uh, 2010. So what has happened is that the technology took uh, incredible speed. And we all started using it. We all somehow stopped socializing. We all suddenly uh, felt alone and rather on uh, the screens. Um, and and that social networks, actually. And social networks, but, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, YouTube, Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes beyond that. So um, what has happened is uh, that it really impacted the teenagers that were 20, 10, 10 years old and so on, right? And um, the technology advanced, but nobody was talking about how to manage your engagement with the technology. I started talking um, on behalf of Google in 2017 how important it is to use parental controls or switch off notifications, mute, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there was the disparity of like, you know, social, uh, let's say isolation, technology advancement, and then suddenly now we have this aha moment of like, oh, everybody needs to know how to actually manage your phone, your time, your me time, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the question is what we could do to really shift it, right? So I think to what Olga was saying, it's incredibly important that you have the tools that are suitable for you, which is uh, going muted, going on like switching off your phones, et cetera, et cetera. When it comes to our kids, you have to really uh, care about the play childhood patterns. So encouraging play, encouraging independence, encouraging um, also safety and explaining what to do, what not to do, what are the threats, et cetera, et cetera. So there is a lot of things that we could do. Some say, um, 
free technology schools, uh, but I'm saying uh, high enough education to understand, you know, the devices and the technology. So that's kind of the quick summary. <laughs> well, how successful are you in dealing with your screen time? Because, well, this is when I when I'm preparing for any event, I need to focus at least for two hours without being distracted. That's why I'm working at night because through the day it's still someone calling, writing me emails, uh, needing my response for something. It doesn't give me two hours. But well, it would be quite easy. I would just turn off uh, my mobile disconnect email and I would have the two hours, but I'm not able to do it. Are you more successful? Arta? Yeah. Um, at least during the PhD phase, which was four years, I managed to wake up at five and have like one and a half hour of no distraction. Uh, but I was struggling a lot with uh, putting my phone off during the midday because at 5 a.m. normally nobody is going to text you. So it's kind of usual to have that uh, no distraction timing. Uh, but I use, lo I, I test myself a lot in several things, including with my kids because it's, it's a trap, like it's, it's very, very difficult to disconnect. Uh, what I usually do is I leave my phone and just have a walk and have my thoughts, uh, especially when it comes to having some decisions or having a brainstorming with myself and see what direction I should go. Uh, this, this is the, for me the best therapy because I uh, love hiking, I love walking and it depends on the topic. Sometimes it's a longer walk, sometimes it's a shorter walk without the phone and I think that works the best. But, uh, but it's, uh, it's very, very challenging to completely turn off your phone because you always think maybe something urgent will come in the moment that you're in. Maybe it will be just a call from your family or something. So uh, like turning off fully, it's uh, difficult, but at least for the social media, I try to remove everything and have at least less distraction than if I would have them installed. Thanks, Olga. I have a little test for myself and that's how how many pages of a book I can read without having the first thought and grabbing my phone. It's always good because when you know you read two lines and you're like, oh, maybe I should. And uh, then you know that you really need to like switch off. But like for me, I don't think d uh, disconnecting is completely necessary. Maybe I should think about it more. But I do put a lot of, on many groups mute buttons and uh, I kind of switch of some notifications a lot and I'm actually happier so sometimes also just like you know having some hygiene because you know I don't need to deal with something that is in some ran random work group at this point when I'm with my kid or with my husband like it's I don't need to be there immediately because some of the things that are happening are not of such importance anymore so I think there has to be some like a level of your notifications that you set so that you know when your phone is buzzing on a walk with your husband, it's gonna be something important. And uh, then definitely like not trying to be the best at each category that you do and just maybe just take like three, four. Monica? Yeah, my my uh, uh, tool to uh, manage the time is really scheduling. Uh, scheduling, I, I've come to the point when I'm uh, really scheduling my free time because it helps me to uh, assign the importance to it and uh, then I know that this is the time that I allocate to some activity and uh, what also helps when I know, when I'm scheduled like that, uh, it's also easier for me to communicate to my colleagues, to my family, and uh, then it's easier to uh, stick to the plan. Of course, you have to be flexible because ne never, never, it's not possible that everything goes according to the plan, so you have to account for some adjustments, but uh, yeah, scheduling works for me. Thanks. So I, I think there are different tools and different kind of routines that works for, you know, each of us, right? So um, I'm doing really well with technology because of my uh, experience and the burnout and so on. Um, so whatever works for you is really the good choice, whether it's the notifications or completely switching off. But there's been a social experiment um, basically tested how really hard it is for people to give away their phone. If you ask someone, can I borrow your phone? or give me your phone. 
You know, you should try that sometimes. You go to yoga or whatever, just to forget your phone at home. It's quite an interesting, um, you know, experience, and you can watch what's going on inside your head, and and you can get lost. Uh, well, <laughs> then uh, it's a bit of trouble, but you can always go the old way and ask. You know. Yeah. But it's surprising. <laughs> Yeah, uh, Maybe the, you're the lucky to have yoga nearby. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't really, but uh, yesterday I forgot my phone, so I was I'm just like... I had to go to a meeting and my phone died, the battery. And it was a street in Prague I didn't know. And I had to actually start asking and giving directions. So it was, uh, it was interesting for me because my, it's like my brain didn't even want to start thinking like that. It's like when you have a calculator in front of you and you want to do the math because it's in front of you. And so my brain was started like biohacking itself to remember the streets again. <laughs> it's interesting how when we speak about well-being, we immediately get to the technology and how it is influencing us. What else influences your well-being? How do you care of yourself? Maybe? Mm -hmm. Arta. Um, I uh, value health to the highest extent possible because I lost my mom when I was six. So kind of every day was an important day to live for me. And I guess I was driven by that logic forever, which is why taking care of myself was very important. Like obviously I would have some phases where I would abuse with my myself, meaning work-wise. Um, and now with my two kids, they are definitely the reason to um, always kind of do good, be a better person, try to take care of them and again be healthy because they need you to be healthy and uh, uh, no matter how good it is to be successful in life, I guess without having that, uh, uh, that authenticity of yourself and be very much driven to communication human to human and to create the values that we as maybe older generation grew up with without technology. I think it's very, very important because then you end up giving screen time and then obviously the education would go through different ways instead of yourself as a, as a parent, let's say. That brings me to another question. I was always wondering, do we learn from experience of someone else or do we need to go through it by ourselves, burnout? What other people believe you that it can happen if they will not change how, do, how they live, the way they live? I think it depends on uh, like the specifics. So they say, for instance, experts, um, psychologists, that betrayal is non-translatable, meaning you can feel um, that you really know what it means, but unless you went through it, you don't really know. You cannot um, express the full empathy. Uh, the burnout, you know, you could also say, I probably can imagine, but to going through it is, is very different. So I think it really depends. We all can probably agree and be empathetic when we talk about stress, because we all went through it, right? Something chronic as well. So then we can give advice on, okay, I know uh, what I would tell you. But with the burnout and just what I was going through, for instance, and I was, of course, talking about it among my friends, they couldn't help. It was way more serious than you would think, you know, because the changes you have to make, the understanding of the situation is way more deeper um, than just like a stressful situation that you can probably more likely use breathing to get out of, et cetera, et cetera. So I think it, it depends. I would just like to ask, uh, to add one thing, um, I don't know about your case or many other people that experience burnout, but I truly believe that um, one should have a hobby, which usually it should be sports or at least anything that is uh, outside screen, it can be art or sports. I think that is something that uh, creates the, um, the obligatory me time, which then kind of drags you outside that routine, which uh, sometimes you're 
so passionate or so, so aggressively in a way working on that. And that, that sort of creates a little bit balance with yourself and with uh, your being. Um, but um, because as I said, like sometimes we are used to abuse with ourselves and say, yeah, I can do it. Maybe just a little bit, just a bit more and more uh, until we reach that point of uh, burnout, which is not easy. Uh, it's not like a click and then you go back and say, I'm fine. I think especially if you're heading there, then an example you, you know, of a burnout can really help you because I think we're all very smart women and we know when we are doing things wrong or we're going a little f too far. So then when you see that your good friend is having those issues, I had it, my friend was then, she was kind of not fainting out of nowhere. And um, uh, it was stress related and she's, she has dealt with it, everything is fine now. But maybe I a little bit knew that I have to slow certain things down. Yeah, it's definitely the close uh, experience with uh, such situation that uh, can help us uh, be more aware of the risks. Uh, but uh, I think one of the uh, also, also strategies to uh, like avoid uh, such situations is uh, building healthy relationships uh, that uh, will uh, help us uh, to get into healthy routines. Uh, also for me, it's very important having around me people who show me a good example, how they incorporate sports or other activities in their life. And uh, yeah, I think that's, that's a good strategy. I'm looking at you ladies, if you have some questions or some point, we have other very busy uh, leaders here, so you may uh, share your uh, experience as well, but if not, um, I would like to get some advice from you. If there is something you could change in the way you were behaving uh, before the aha moment, uh, what would it be? The one thing that we should focus on not to get to the burnout moment mm -hmm. or, uh, or any habit that you got to have? So I, I would say to August's point, not to let it really get to the point of uh, ideally the burnout because you kind of know where you're heading, uh, but it's important to pause and spend some time on it. So I make the changes early on. So in my case, you know, sports, great, or any type of routine, wonderful. Um, social uh, community and your friends are extremely- Not the one here, but the no. one here. Yeah, correct. Uh, extremely important, uh, you know, it's very different to your professional bubble, right? Um, and also uh, really, um, facing your career and having those pauses and, and just like uh, trying to play, trying to do something that you really love or trying something new uh, that can distract you from just being workaholic and, and going forward, you know, flight um, and fight mode with like uh, uh, extreme execution is very important. I think being in leadership position or C-level position requires a lot of overwhelming work. Like uh, nobody became overnight uh, somebody without having a lot of work. And um, we always laugh with my sisters that uh, when you start bumping your head or having an accident, <laughs> be aware that something is happening. Sometimes we tend to say like, oh, it was just an accident or it was some other people's fault. But if you want to really pause and talk to yourself and admit that you're simply overwhelmed, you have to stop something. Like if you have too many things in your plate, you have to prioritize what is more important. Um, I guess for female, it's more, or, or I at least consider that it's easier because we talk, we communicate. And I remember that I had several cases where I, would, I was really kind of at the edge of burnout and I would really speak loudly to my smaller circle and said like, I'm gonna experience burnout. Like I'm, I'm really like overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. Like everything was so important. Like I just couldn't leave one of the things and say, okay, this is less important. So I'm not dealing with that. Sometimes things come in 
not very much planned way, which is um, not so easy to say, okay, I'll just remove that. It would be amazing to have that kind of uh, puzzle <laughs> where, <laughs> and possibility where you just uh, take off something and then you're released, uh, especially for a phase of time. But I guess when you have that circle around you that helps you and say, yeah, just a little bit, you know, like a few more steps, just like in marathon, like you're almost there, you can see the finish and just don't think about that, don't bother about that, you're almost done and it sort of helps you out, obviously not to extend this this marathon, but to know the finish that you can see it and you can see that it's it's going there, then it all also helps. Uh, what it really helped me is also having multiple engagement which are not uh, rela related to each other. To your point, I love Legos. <laughs> so, uh, I could play with your son for sure for hours. <laughs> we build so many things. It's uh, like whatever we do in our daily life, you go home, and if you really keep the focus of Legos or whatever kind of uh, play that you have, it's a, a full distraction with your brain that at least that level of the brain is kind of released from all the tensions that you gave during the daytime so that you're moving and switching to some other parts of it, which then sort of create this um, possibility to have an integration of all your engagements. Thank you. Any of your habits that you implemented uh, that help you? I would tell my 27-year-old to sleep better and to listen to my uh, body. So uh, based on the stories with my son that we re read, uh, back in the days there were hunters, as there were people that were protecting the, uh, the places in the, uh, in the night and in the morning. And that's why we were designed to be night owls and early birds. And I'm just a night owl, so you won't see me at the office at seven or eight. I just come rather a little later because I'm awake long. And those two hours extra sometimes just really make the difference. So I would li listen to your body. <laughs> Thank you, Monica. And I would recommend just learn to set boundaries and uh, learn to say no. And uh, maybe in this uh, context, we can be inspired by the younger generations because I think they are so much better at that. And it's uh, when I see them, they inspire me and uh, I'm getting better at it. It's actually what I've also appreciated uh, when seeing Olga's presentation. Uh, yeah, the boundaries, they have them and we need to learn that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga, Monica, Katerina, and Arta. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>